Hello folks, and welcome to this month's part one. Sorry, I have to move over from the computer and pressing start record. I have to go onto this rather uh, awkward chair, my desk chair. So yeah, welcome to part one of this month's online class. So I uh, uh, appreciate you all bearing with me to the shift over to monthly. It's uh, much easier for me to be able to record all the videos, obviously, in one go and edit those so I can spend a day or two just doing all of the videos uh, rather than just breaking those up from week to week. And in terms of the content, it means you've got those four weeks and I, I do appreciate that some people do work at different rates to other people. So if you do find yourself working through this, uh, you know, you're steaming through it, you've got those four weeks you can kind of go through from start to finish and then you might want to revisit after you've gone through the whole process start again with week one and just go through the exercises again and try those or you have the month obviously at your leisure and beyond because this is going to be a youtube link from now on uh, while i reformat the gumroad sessions which will probably now come in the form of uh, as i mentioned previously in the form of workshop sessions or workshop videos so i suppose you could call it a workshop or a course it would be like an eight to ten hour video covering different subjects different media different techniques uh, color theory composition all those kind of things so you can go onto the gunroad store purchase that for about 10 to 15 pounds for the eight to ten hours content and then you can download that and keep that so that will be yours to always refer to so it'd be a really good kind of visual uh, library that you can start to accrue because obviously I it's all recorded so it's all on video but uh, I am able to demonstrate a lot more during these videos than I am during my physical classes I always try to do some demonstrations during my physical evening class and soon to be hopefully a, an afternoon class now on Mondays but I don't have the luxury of being able to sit down and just really go through the drawing process with you and the whole my whole thought process as I'm as I'm working through it. So I can really explore that a lot more with video than I can in class. Okay. So we're going to be covering the figure for these four weeks, with our ultimate goal being at the end of the period in week uh, in part three and part four, we'll be looking at bringing it, bringing the first two parts, the information we've uh, learn and developed over those two parts, bringing those together and producing a, a relatively accurate line drawing of a figure in week three and then we'll go on to render and, and just paint that in a in a quite a simple way. It's not going to be superly rendered. We're going to go for these are kind of a, a, a mid a, a mid stage drawing and painting I would say that I would generally do myself if I'm going to a life drawing class and I'm limited to poses that are maybe 15 20 minutes at, at most so you don't have time to really fully render something fully shade it with a, a full value range or paint it uh, as likewise with a full value range it's, it's more kind of like an intermediate pr uh, uh, stage so it's aimed really at giving you enough information to be able to produce a nice volumetric gestural figure drawing or painting around the 20 minute mark because I'm a big believer with my teaching that quantity is much more beneficial than quality so you will learn and develop far more rapidly far more quickly if you repeat the process over and over and quite rapidly so the more drawing and more painting you get done the more you're going to learn as opposed to sticking with one single drawing or painting for several hours and of course there are benefits to that and you will learn something but the benefits in terms of knowledge and the, the, the accruing of knowledge will not be 
anywhere near as much as you would be if you did this iterative, re repetitive process of, of study. Okay, so for part one we're just going to go through just looking at the core of the figure, which is the combined rib cage and pelvis mass that make up the torso, and then we'll, we'll be adding the neck and head in a very simple way. So that's really our starting point because the torso, combined torso mass is the really the, the, the essential core of, of the figure. The, the arms can take a multitude, the arms and legs, and even the head to some extent and neck, can take a multitude of different positions and orientations from this solid core of the torso, combined torso and pelvis mass. So that's where we're going to start this week. And some of you will find that this is echoing what I'm going to be doing in my, uh, in, in my evening class as of next week. So you'll have this, if you, if you do attend my physical classes, and you'll, I think there are a couple of people still doing the online tuition who do come to physical classes, then you'll have this as a, as a more uh, extended, more intimate look into the process over what I'm able to show you during the evening class. So this will, this will be basically just a, a, a more in-depth look into, into the process and you'll get to see me working through it and talking about what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Okay, so two quite important things you're gonna need for the first part, and actually all, a, a lot of other exercises that I do teach in future will really benefit from you having a tracing paper pad. So this is um, this is just a pad I picked up in Salisbury uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's five pounds from Speedy Print. You get fifty sheets for five pounds, A4 size, quite lightweight. But the, the crucial thing is that it, you can see through the paper. So sometimes you can get this very cloudy paper, but you can see this is a nice translucent paper that we can see very clearly through. So that's key when you're selecting your, your tracing paper pad. I know that WH Smiths do a, a good pad. It's slightly thicker tracing paper. You get 30 sheets for about five pounds, I think. But I think this is the best value because the sheets don't need to be thick uh, in terms of weight. So you're just getting more sheets for your, for your buck with this pad. So tracing paper, very, very important because what we use the tracing paper for is to overlay it over our reference materials or our reference photographs of the figure and break down the anatomy directly over the reference and then we can take the sheet of tracing paper away from the reference put it over a sheet of white paper and we can just see that breakdown and hopefully it will kind of make more sense to you visually having these breakdowns and then being able to translate those breakdowns freehand onto your pad okay so reference images there are a number available i will show you very quickly if i can if i nip onto youtube so i'm on youtube now so if i type in new masters gesture poses okay so new oh, new masters gesture poses you can see it brings up a whole load of timed poses and they're all around about 35 minutes long so you can pause these at any point but they generally start with quite short poses one two minutes and they go up to 10 minutes I think maximum but there's a whole host of here. You've got some clothed models, you've got nude models, um, and there's a real great wealth of, of content there. So I would suggest using those as your reference, and you can screen capture those if you want to print them off onto a piece of paper, if you have a printer at home, or if you have a, an iPad or, or you're working from a desktop computer, you can just pause it and work from the screen, have your pad next to you. But if you're going to be overlaying, obviously with tracing paper, it's important that you're you're able to print those off. Okay, and the only reason why I can't 
send you the images that I'm going to be using for the four weeks is that they're paid for pose packs that I purchased online and obviously for, they're for my use only so the license only extends to me so if I were to share those with you and, and obviously someone found out and, and the owner of the, the property then I would be in quite serious trouble so <laughs> I'd rather not take that risk but there is ample uh, reference material available online even if you just go into Google's um, image search and type in gesture poses uh, new gesture poses or clothed gesture poses it'll bring up a whole range of uh, images you can use on there okay so uh, we're just going to go through some basic proportions initially as I said we're, we're mainly dealing with the core of the figure for this uh, this week so I hope if I zoom in we're not going to lose focus too much make sure that yeah no, that looks pretty good okay so I've just got this front view of the figure here I'm going to take a sheet of my tracing paper that I'm getting through this tracing paper it's it's nice and translucent so I get a good good view of the underlying image let's just take a masking tape so you will find the tracing paper does slip all over the place generally so I always find it useful just to to tape that down okay oh bear with me folks I just need to grab a pencil for that <laughs> I thought it was fully prepared but I left my pencil in the other room okay so we're just going to look at the basic breakdown of the figure here on the left okay so what the first thing I want to do is just draw a vertical line straight down through the center of the figure so that's coming through the center of the face as the, the head is um, central and facing forwards so we're coming right down through the breasts down the sternum our navel would be roughly about here, right down to the middle of the legs there. Okay. All right. So that's very important. We just get that central line, which in a, in a upright front view pose, this is what you'll learn later, is referred to as our line of action, and we can do it on here as well which uh, in front view poses generally will take in the pit of the neck down through the sternum through the navel down to the pubic area here or the pubis okay so so our next landmark I'm just going to make, make a little mark at the top here for the top of the head which would be there over there okay so I'll just draw a line across there just in case you can't see it too well let me see if we can zoom in a little bit more here without losing focus kind of looks pretty focused still let me just check my focus quickly focus pretty focused okay so hopefully you can see that a little bit better now so we've got our line here at the top for the head and we're gonna make a line here which comes through the pit of the neck 
to the shoulders. Okay. So this represents roughly where the clavicles would be. They're obviously not straight across. The clavicles do have this handlebar shape. You can see that there coming up. Okay. But for the purpose of this line, if you just look at these two prominent bumps here, which is where the clavicles meet the scapula, which comes around from the back. The scapula is your shoulder blade. So I'm not going to go too much into anatomy at all with any of this. This is really just to get you thinking about approaching the figure in a quite a simple way. And we're just going to cover a few anatomy landmarks that are very useful in drawing. Okay, now we can see that we have a na the narrowest point of the waist here and here. Okay, this marks the bottom of our rib cage just here. Okay, so I'm going to come across there. Oh, it's a little bit lower than that. About there. Okay. So hopefully now already you can see that these two divisions are equal. So this would be one third because we have a total of three thirds coming down for the head and the combined torso mass of the rib cage and pelvis. So then we have two thirds. And finally, if we come down here to the pubis, we have our final third. Okay. So, in line with the pubis is also the widest parts of the hips, uh, and they're as wide as they are because of the bone of the big bone, upper bone of the leg, the femur, and it comes out this way from the pelvis, and then it will come in this way again. Don't worry too much about the anatomy, but that's it's the femur bone, uh, the trochanter it's called, big ball um, part of the, that femur bone that makes the, the, the hips, you know, gives that width to the, the hips here, the widest point just here, you can see. Okay. So you'll also notice that the widest points here of the hips and the line of the pubis are also in line with the wrists. So that's two other very useful landmarks. When we come to add the limbs, which will be part two, and also the bottom of the rib cage is in line with the elbows. Okay, and you can see if I draw a line up in a female figure, the width of the hips is generally the same width as the widest parts of the shoulders. In a man, the, nips, uh, the hips are narrower, so they won't be quite there, they'll, they'll be more over here. But in a female, generally the width, uh, the width of the hips is the same width as the widest parts of the shoulders, uh, the widest points, sorry, of the shoulders. Okay, and then if we're just gonna simplify our anatomy down, she's actually on tiptoes here, so I'm just going to draw a line where the heels would be. We can, if we're going on an idealized eight head figure, so that's the length of eight heads down through the figure. Now this is an idealized classical proportion, proportional division, just to kind of elongate the figure slightly, give it longer legs and make it look a bit more kind of godly and heroic in statue. Generally the actual human proportions in terms of head length through the figure is around about six and three quarters, seven heads. Um, some people have slightly longer legs so they might go up to seven and a half but rarely eight. Eight is a very idealized proportion. As I say the average is about six and three quarters, seven heads. But we're going to be just using for convenience the eight head figure. So with the eight head figure from the top of the head to the pubis we just take that distance there, that length as being our halfway point, the pubis, and that will come down to the heels, okay? So that's our eight head division. So your pubis from the top of the head to the heels is always the halfway point, okay? So now we can just go in and break these thirds up. So the head is going to be uh, if I go from the top of the head to the bottom of the nose, which would also be the line of the bottom of the ears, that's the halfway point from the top of the head to the pit of the neck. 
So the head's going to be a head and height, just here. And then our neck comes down here. Okay, so it's about, yeah. So we've got heart up, because this is, uh, all of these divisions are a head and a half in length. So as they're all equal, they're all going to be one and a half heads in length. So we've got a head here, and then we've got a half a head length for the neck below the chin to the sternum. Okay. Then the rib cage is an egg shape, which comes up here. And you can see it's coming right up into the neck area. And I'll explain that a little bit later in a bit more detail as to why that happens when we have some slightly different angle of poses. So the rib cage comes right up here and it's an egg shape. So it's narrower on the top and wider at the bottom. Okay. And we have these two points here, which are these points just there. So I, I will be able to send you this reference actually, everyone, uh, because this was a, this is a, an anatomy figure I have myself. And this is just a picture from Google images. So I can send you this one just so you can go through these and have this, if you, if you just go through this part of the video with your tracing paper and have this just to, to the one side as you work through all the exercises throughout these four parts, this will be a good reference just to refer to, just to check your proportions. Okay, now the pelvis from the bottom of the pubis here, we can just draw an ellipse on its side here that's a head in height. Okay, so we take a head height there, make sure that's a head in height, so it's coming up a little bit more. Okay, so the pelvis is one head in height, and then we have these muscles just here, which are here. Um, and the abdomen sits in there, our abdominal muscles. But we have these muscles here, which are the external obliques. Hopefully you can see these, I'll just shade that in. And they are half a head in height. Okay, so we have a head in height for the pelvis and a half a head for the muscles attaching the pelvis to the rib cage. Okay, so we're not covering legs here, but generally if I'm doing front view leg, the inside of the leg, I'll just use a straight line for this side and two C curves to create a B rhythm for this side. But as I say, we're going to be going into uh, adding the limbs later. Okay, so I think that covers all the basic proportions there that we'll be using for the first exercise. If I take that off, we can just see that there now. Okay. We have our rib cage, our pelvis, and if I were to simplify this out and bring it over here, we're going to be working with this combined mass. And when it's combined, it forms a kind of beam shape. Okay, wider obviously down this end to take into account the width of the pelvis. This is our egg shape. But it's kind of like a kind of a bean shape it's not quite obviously symmetrical like this this would actually be more a male where the hips are narrower but we have kind of like a, a bean like that okay but in this case with this female figure because of the width of the hips it's going to be just a wider portion of the bean at the bottom but this will always be our halfway point this narrow point of the of the hips Okay, so just here, halfway from the clavicles to the pubis. Okay. Right. So the first thing to do is to take your printed reference, if you've been able to print some off. And we're just going to apply this basic breakdown to the 
uh, with the tracing paper, overlay that over these, and we're just going to apply this basic breakdown and just try to break down the anatomy. Okay, so we're not worried about the limbs. And these are a bit small, but hopefully you should be able to see. So I'm just going to look at, remember I mentioned the line of action, so I'm always looking at this line coming down here through the sternum, uh, through the middle of the navel and down to the pubis. Okay, so I'm always looking at this line here. So this is my line of action. Okay, so then we can come up with our bean shape, uh, our ribcage shape, sorry, that egg wider at the bottom comes down, takes into uh, takes in all of, you can see that the bottom of the ribcage is quite clear here with the shadow, takes in the whole of that <coughs> and then this would be the halfway point just here, we come round, okay, so if I move this um, and our, remember our pelvis of head in heights, so, <coughs> excuse me, so the pelvis is actually, the upper torso here is coming forwards a bit. <coughs> so the pelvis is further back in space. So that's why we're getting, A, we'll have some overlap here. But also this normally would be our halfway point, but it's just a little, not quite halfway now, because we're seeing more of this rib cage as it's coming towards us, and less of this um, lower region. It's not quite halfway now. You can see the division's not quite equal. In most poses, um, certainly standing poses, uh, upright poses, as you'll see here, they will be equal. Uh, and this one should be relatively equal. This one here will be equal, but I'll go through those in, in turn. So let's just overlap, lay, overlay that again. Now with the head, all you need to do is just draw a circle for the cranial mass and then just bring off the jaw and just a simple line for the center of the neck okay so I should actually I'll just uh, do a little aside um, we're going to be dealing a lot with central axes of forms in this so the central axis is the if I draw a cylinder our central vertical axis will go right through that center of that form, okay? So it goes right through the middle. So if I was to draw a rib cage, say, like this. Now this is this this line of action, which would normally be our line of action, this line coming through the sternum down through the navel, which will be about here, down to the pubis. This is the, our surface center line of the form as it wraps around the form. But the actual central axis is the line that goes right through the middle of the form, just there. And it's pitched because the, the ribcage is going back that way. Okay, So it's important to understand what the actual central axis is and what the surface center line is. Okay. So this, this will be our center line of our figure here on the surface of the rib cage, and this is the center line going through the true center of that, that X shape, or in this case, this cylinder, okay? So axis, uh, when I refer to act, the axis of a form, the central axis, then hopefully now you know what I'm talking about there. Okay, so we'll go over to this figure here now. Same thing, start with the pit of the neck. I'll draw a line down through the sternum, down through the navel, down to the pubis, our line of action. Do a line up here. Actually, that's one thing I didn't put in there. You've got to always make sure you draw that clavicle line in at the top. Okay. Bring in the egg shape of the rib cage. And then come out here. Head up in height for this oval is there and then we go again okay can you see that we have that bean shape I'll do these a bit bigger I worked on some of the images from my iPad in a moment and again make sure you 
put the head on. You see when I'm doing the head, this line I'm doing for the, uh, the line through the center of the neck is our central axis of that neck cylinder. Okay, so the neck is essentially a cylinder and then it has muscles that come around. So that's what creates the shape of the neck. But effectively the, the core of the neck is just a cylinder which sits in here and then the rib cage would come up and envelop that. Okay. So, so all you need to do is just go through all of these breaking down your line of action through the sternum and the rib cage form in and the pelvis and attaching that to give us our bean combined kind of bean shape okay so it's very important you do the tracing so you can see the actual form you're trying to replicate on your paper. So if I was to do that then over here, I've got my line of action, something like that somewhat. My rib cage coming down here and out and around. Another tool around there. So I'm just replicating what I've drawn there um, and not particularly very well actually. <laughs> Let's do that again. <coughs> so this is, this is a good example of getting the line of action not quite curved enough. So do that again and really make sure I get that curvature of this line of action first. So I've got my ribcage form here. Just that egg shape and coming out. So I would bring this around here. Actually, even more, I think. Okay. <coughs> so we end up with this kind of bean form here. If I were just to simplify the contour there a little bit. Okay, that's our little bean. And then the head, which pose we on there. So we have a central axis for the neck, circle for the cranium, and just come off for the jaw there. Okay. So that's the first step for everyone. So do as many of these as you can. Just break down the anatomy on there, overlaying the uh, egg shape rib cage, the ellipse on its side for the pelvis, and then the muscles attaching to create a combined form, which looks like our bean here. Obviously, considering your line of action through the sternum, and your clavicles, so make sure you always get those clavicles in as well. And then the central axis of the neck and head on top there, knowing that that's a third. Okay. Now when I, when I talk about these divisions, obviously these divisions will only hold true <coughs> if the head is upright. If her head were to tilt towards me, obviously this division, you know, if she was looking kind of uh, headed looking down here and we're seeing the top of the head then obviously this is not going to be a third okay it's only when the figure is fully extended the neck and head are fully extended the torso is fully extended and um, and upright and neither of these forms is advancing or receding they're both on the same plane then uh, these divisions will hold up otherwise there will be some slight variations in the divisions okay so, let's move over to my iPad. Okay, so let's 
let's take this one for example. Okay, so we're going to go through the sternum, uh, uh, the uh, uh, pit of the neck, down through the sternum, through the navel, down to the pubis. So you might just want to use your pencil just to visually trace that in your mind's eye. Obviously, if you're using a tracing paper, you'll have an overlay of this anyway. But I'm just going to do a start with my clavicle. Probably best to start with your clavicle line actually and the angle of that. I can see that my clavicles are going up at this angle. Then I can find out where my pit of the neck is. And now I can just think about doing that line of action. Okay, just coming through there. Now I'm gonna go up and do my rib cage egg. see this is my pinch point just here where the pelvis is going to come off so I know this is my halfway point from here to here draw my over on the side there and the pubis is here Okay, so look at that. So that's those two combined forms. And then I can do the center line for the axis of the neck. Coming up to the top, so that's going to be another third. So we've got one, two, three. Four for the head, come off here. So that's those, that's those combined forms. And that's just all I want you to do for these is your combined torso and uh, rib cage, uh, combined torso, rib cage and pelvis, and the head and neck. Okay, so we're not doing any limbs at the moment. We'll later add those. And that's relatively easy to do when once you've got this nice solid core. So I don't want you to do the legs, as I said, or the arms, but I just want to show you how simple it is once we have this nice solid core. <coughs> how simple we can use some nice long rhythmic gestural lines to, to finish out the figure there. Okay, so let's do a, oh yeah, and this brings me to a very important point that you need to bear in mind. And this hopefully should explain a bit more why the rib cage really goes right up here. So, I don't know if I've got a side view, I don't think I have, no. But what happens is that the pelvis and the rib cage, when um, they're above one another and balanced, have a kind of counter effect, which is uh, sometimes referred to, well, is referred to as contraposto, but it's basically a cantilever. It's a redistribution redistribution of weight <coughs> to kind of create balance. <coughs> so what happens? You'll generally see is that the rib cage, and if this is our central axis, is pitched back, so it's going back that way, and then the pelvis, if I do the central axis, is pitched back this way. Okay. So our rib cage goes back. And the pelvis goes back this way. Now because the pelvis is going back in space down here, that means that we see some of the opening of it. Okay, at the top. And the rib cage, we'd see a little bit of the underside of this form. So I'll just shade those two in. Okay. So it might be easier if I just show you that in profile view. So what, what we have with the rib cage in profile is, if I just draw the shape here first, and this would be the ribs coming down here. So 
you can see that's it's definitely pitched back that way now to create balance <coughs> the pelvis will be pitched this way <coughs> okay and what that means is that we're seeing this portion here would be visible to us and I'm going to square these off a little bit later <coughs> and that hopefully might make sense a bit more Okay, and with the rib cage, we'd see a little bit of the underside here if our if we were looking from this point. Okay, and also you'll notice as well that the neck, <coughs> the ellipse aperture for the neck, this will be the pit of the neck in the front, but the neck attaches much higher in the back. Uh, it attaches at the seventh cervical vertebrae, which is the very bony prominence of your top of your spine that you can feel if you reach around to your back and just feel that real bony lump. Um, if you pitch your head forwards, it's a bit more prominent. So the neck attaches higher in the back, lower in the front. And that's why we have this tilt here um, for the neck. So that's what I'm well, that's what I'm taking into account here. Okay, is that is this angle or the inclination? All right. So when you're drawing your ribcage form, make sure you come right up above where the pit of the neck is, so you're take you're taking it all the way up to the seventh cervical vertebrae in the back. So don't worry if you don't. You don't know, understand all this terminology too too early. Hopefully, with the visual demonstrations, <coughs> I'll bring that home to you all visually, so you don't have to worry about all the terminology. Just just try to see what I'm doing, and I'll I'll talk through it every time I, I go through that process, and hopefully that will start to to gel. Okay, so let's do a few more. So still back view here. <coughs> so with a back view, obviously our line of action is going to be slightly different now. It's coming down through the back. You can still use, if I, if I do a curved line here, if I was trying to visualize the sternum and down through the navel to the pubis in the front, I can see that the curve is here. It's a C curve. So we work with three different types of curves or lines. We have C curves, S curves and straight lines. Oop, I better do that down here because we can't see. C, C curves, and they can be any type of C curve. Um, then we have an S curve, and again, that can be any type of S curve. And then we have straight lines. And quite handily, that spells out CSI, which I always, always think of crime scene investigation. Uh, when I write this out. So it's a good way to remember it. Crime scene investigation, CSI, if you've watched a TV series. So you've got your C curve, S curve, and straight lines. <coughs> so we can see a C curve that we would have if we were seeing the front of the figure coming down here. But you can see with the spine, we end up more with, an, with a kind of S curve coming down, or, or yeah, an S curve here and then a C curve here for the bottom. Okay, but you might find it easier to just draw the C curve that you would generally see if you were looking at it from the front. And again, we want to go for the line of the shoulders. And that's coming up that way slightly. Okay, so let's go in now and draw in our egg shaped rib cage. So now the surface center line here will be the spine coming down on that C curve I mentioned here. So we can put that in. So this pinch point would roughly be our halfway point from here to here, down to here. So this would be the pubis in front. But you will notice that the buttocks do come down a little bit lower in the back. So this is going to be just a little bit lower. So not quite the same distance. So if this is a half, this is going to be a little bit more than a half this little bit extra okay in the back so bear that in mind you know you won't have to worry too much if you're doing 
just front view hoses. We'll just do a little head height there. Okay. for is our bean combined bean form here okay and again when we come to do our our limbs we'll just see how as long as we have a nice solid foundation for the torso, combined torso mass, that's pretty straightforward then to, to add those, those limbs. Okay, so I think that's probably enough of an example there for you to, to get going with those. You've just seen I've, I've worked out a few there. Let's see if I've got enough room. Just move the paper over. I'll do one more in a view that's a bit bit different. So let's go for this one here. Okay, so again, start with the clavicles. So look at that angle. Really make sure you're getting that angle correct. You can have a reference next to you. If you can move it across without moving your hand too much, just to check that angle. It's always a good way. Better if you can do it visually. If you can just see the line there, you can just reproduce that angle there. Then let's say this is going to be the pit of the neck. This is my line of action coming through. Okay, then I can go in for my sternum. Uh, my my rib cage, sorry. Um, you, and you want to refer to the sternum and make sure you can see that we're seeing less of the rib cage on this side and more of the rib cage on this side. So the sternum is sitting more over towards this side. So we've got to make sure that when you're drawing your egg shape that you're allowing for that. And then this is our pinch point, the bottom of the rib cage. So that's where it's going to come out. And down. There we have our bean again. Okay. <coughs> so remember that the pelvis is pitched backwards, so it's going backwards in space that way, and the rib cage is going slightly back that way. It's probably a bit more upright actually the ribcage but the pelvis is definitely pitched back. Okay. So as I said we will be looking into squaring the pelvis off which we'll probably do in part two which just basically turns this into a kind of rounded edge rectangular form. So we end up with a bean shape up here and a rectangular form down here for the pelvis okay but it all fits within that bean the reason for doing that is that it just enables us if I was to draw an oval I can't really see which way that oval is facing until I draw a top um, plane bring a line down for the center here and maybe indicate a couple of side planes here now I can see that this um, uh, oval form is facing that direction because I have now a surface center line. I have a top plane, a side plane, and a front plane. By squaring off more and making it a more rectangular box, it's a lot easier to see the side plane, top plane, and the forward facing front plane here. Okay, but we'll cover that in part two. 
So I want you to go through all of those with doing that. <clears throat> and then um, I just want, want you to plot out, so you, for this, in this case, because it's a female, I'm just going to indicate where the breasts would be. So maybe here. Okay, I just want you to just have a little look at the shadow shapes coming down the figure. So it comes around here, down this muscle here, and down here, around this breast, up to here. Okay, so if you're drawing, I just want you to plot out the shadow shape and just fill that in so it's just a, a single value. So this is the angle of the shoulders in that pose, but the actual clavicles will be going way up here because the arms are, are coming up, up this, kind of this direction, this direction, okay? But again, don't worry too much about that. As long as you've got the inclination angle of the uh, line of the shoulders correct, that's fine. And by just putting in a little bit of the, of the shadow on this combined beam shape, we're just creating a bit of a sense of form now that we have light coming from this direction and the shadows on this side. Okay, and then again, just bring the leg down. You can see that that shadow would continue down the leg. Shadows are always generally connected. So, come down here. This will come down here. And this is one of the cases where a shadow is not connected to anything else. it starts on the leg here okay so but it's just these this area that we're concerned with and I just want you to have a little look at the shadow pattern you can see on the, on the this one here so we come there down here and the rib cage down there and then there into there and then I can just put some shadow over this side start my timer for this so I don't know how long I've been I've probably been too long okay so it's creating a sense of form there okay <clears throat> so with your shading try to um, make sure that you've got a nice consistent flat value over the area shaded area so I suggest just practice practicing some strokes here just one direction just coming down and keeping the pressure constant so we have a nice even value. And the more you do this, the faster you get, and you can kind of then eventually when you've got enough grasp on pressure you can you can go back and forth. So just trying to create nice it's a bit of a sharp point part of the pencil. You can see I've go, gone a bit too hard there, so I'll have to readjust that now. Okay, but these should be relatively even in their value. Okay, so we're just trying to fill this area with a nice even, even value, <coughs> as opposed to if I was to press here and then I go a bit lighter and I press again uh, or a bit lighter and I'm just scribbling back and forth. You can see now this area here has a variety of different streaks of different values in it. What we're trying to do is to get a nice flat, consistent value. Okay, so that's for uh, the drawing part of this. I will just do a very quick additional painting part. Uh, just taking what we've done here and instead of rendering this in pencil, we'll go in and we'll just put some very simple watercolour washes on to describe some sense of volume. <coughs> okay, so I'll see you back in a moment for that, folks. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're just going to just do the little painting part here now. So I'll just show you my palette here. 
and actually a little recommendation as well. I, I have several of these types of palettes, which are great if you want to create a permanent palette because you can squeeze your colours out and they'll dry out, but you can reactivate your paints so it saves on waste. So this is a nice palette to set up for a permanent palette. It's an aluminium palette with uh, a white enamel coating. I have two of these, um, the Holbein brand, which are slightly better build quality. They're heavier weight, but essentially the same kind of, the same format. But they're much more expensive. The Holbein palettes come in at around about 40 to 50 pounds. This one I got on Amazon. I can't remember the name of the brand, but it's got some Chinese characters there. So it's obviously a Chinese manufacturer. But I can post a link to this to you all, uh, all of the painters uh, amongst you. And this was sixteen ninety nine, so it's a good size. I do like this one because it has a really big mixing area here, which I do like a nice large mixing area. I do have some butcher, butcher trays as well, for painting, which are very useful. Some large butcher trays, which again are a metal with an enamel coating, so they're very good as well. But I do like nice big armpool mixing spaces and for the colours that I've squeezed out here I've got a Van Dyke brown just here you can use burnt umber or Van Dyke brown they're kind of similar I've got a Windsor red any orange red will be fine cadmium red will be fine here but this is a Windsor red it's a nice transparent red warmish red then I have Windsor yellow again a more a kind of uh, orange yellow also very transparent and finally I have French ultramarine here so the blue is going to be used to grey out the orangey reds of my flesh tones so I'm just going to do the painting part here for part one this will apply to the exercises for part two part three we're going to be obviously drawing the figure out and then finally when we come to part four I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, I'll do another painting demonstration there, a very, very quick one for that final part. So this little demo I'm going to do here now with these four colours is going to be what you, you will need to use and will apply to the next part, okay, where we're just adding the limbs. So it's effectively exactly the same, which we're going to be adding the limbs, but rendering it in paint in exactly the same way as I'm about to here. So I'm going to put that over to one side. It's always the way things just tend to disappear when I'm all set up at my drawing board and I <laughs> I'll lose track of where I put my pencil. Where on earth did that go? Exactly the same process here. We've got again the 
underneath. The arms are up, but the angle of inclination through the sternum, uh, the sternum, sorry, through the pit of the neck is here. Okay, so I'm just going to draw that, that angle just there. The pit of my neck would be here. I've got the line of action. Okay, come up to the rib cage. You can also have a look at the angle from the shoulder point here out to the, the pelvis. So they're coming out of that kind of angle, so I can also do that as well. So yeah, this is roughly our halfway point down to here. for the neck, head, okay so that's our, our three major forms there. Okay so I'm going to plot where the breasts are. just think about how that shadow then comes down through the figure so let's just indicate that okay, this needs to <coughs> come out more see a lot of the pelvis here because the leg is coming in over this side over here and the other leg will be there so this is our bean shaped combined mass just here okay oh there's a shadow shadow just there as well and then the face let's just put some shadow over the face it's kind of brows will be there cheek coming down a bit like that so just a nice simple shadow pattern on the face there down the side of the neck and arms will be coming up like that but again that's all for next week okay <coughs> so that's just that rough and plus it out so let's just mix up our flesh tone so I'm going to take a small amount of yellow, so I'm sorry you can't see the palette here, but I will mix the colour over on the paper so you can see it. And then I'm going to add the Windsor Red to make a red-orange. Okay, so flesh is generally going to be orange and more towards, if we're doing Caucasian flesh, more towards the red-orange. So we end up with a, a red orange like that. <coughs> uh, it's got some uh, obviously water in there, so it's a bit more diluted, so it's not too bright, which is what we're looking for for our first layer here. And then I just want to add a little bit of blue because at the moment it's a bit, bit saturated. So by adding some of the complementary to orange, which is blue, 
that will just grey that down a little bit so it takes a bit of that saturation cramer and heat out the, the warmth the real kind of hot redness <coughs> in here just neutralizes that a little bit there okay so for these you might want to start really just by wetting your paper so we're going to do this wet and wet I'm just going to wet the paper here just the area that I'm, I'm concerned with there's those combined masses the water's a little bit dirty <coughs> but in some ways if it's slightly dirty or slightly off-white it does help because you can see where you've wet your paper so where you just make sure you've wet it evenly all over there okay so I'm just going to go back in and re remix a bit more color When you're adding your neutralizing blue to your orange, make sure you just do it a little increment at a time, just a small amount at a time. If you add too much too soon, it's going to go far too neutral and a bit too gray, uh, or towards gray, or in this case, when you mix orange and blue, you get brown. But it's what we refer to as neutralization, so it becomes a bit more neutral, less saturated. Just a nice, nice generic flesh here. Just knock that down a little bit more, just a touch. Okay, so I've got something like that. I'm gonna add more water to it. And now I just want to come in and pretty much there's not a lot of bright highlights on this, so I can just cover this pretty much all over. Certainly in the face area we will add a shadow layer to this and already you can see my papers dried out quite warm in here so I'm just going to have to modify some areas because it gets lighter here over the breast lighter down this side a little bit so I'm just taking a damp brush just to and I can lift out a little bit there, pull this down, and then pick it back up again with my wash. So yeah, shouldn't be doing that. I'm not worried about that part of the uh, the arms yet. So again, just damp brush in here again, just to lift out a little bit here, where I had a few highlights. So this is just a damp staff brush, just going over and pulling the paint out in places. So that's fine for our first wash. We'll just let that dry out a few seconds. Actually, I think my hairdryer might be plugged in. It's always useful to speed up this process if you have a hairdryer. So now I'm just going to go in and mix a darker shadow value. So I probably don't need the brown uh, on the palette for this one because the shadow is not too dark. So I'm just going to mix up a, a darker value red orange and add my blue. So again, we're keeping this simple. The whole painting process for all of these parts is going to be quite simple. As I said, this is really more aimed at rapid repeated study and doing lots of that okay so now I've got my shadow value I can just go in here hairs there little bump and then if I want to 
of soften an edge, just take my damp brush up just to soften an edge off. I think I need to go a bit darker with that shadow value. Let's go back in again. So you don't have to mix exactly the right colour as long as we've got a, a darker, more neutralised value here. Here, down the neck. My shadow comes down there, down this breast. Down here, down here, down here. Okay, so there is reflected light bouncing into this side of the figure, but I'm going to ignore that just for the sake of a nice clear shadow pattern. Okay, so that's a little bit warm actually, this colour. I should have neutralised that a little bit more. And then I can just take a damp brush here if I want to soften some of these edges and transitions. Again, this is not watercolour paper, this is mixed media paper, so it's drying very quickly. Too large a brush here for this, in all fairness. Quite small. Okay, so it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be, you know, the perfect wash, but I'm sure you'll, you'll agree now that there is a sense of <coughs> light coming in from this side. And we have a sense of where the shadow is falling. Okay, and then if we dry that up again, we can just put a little intermediate value in there. somewhere between our light value and the dark one that I've put on. Normally we'd probably do this as the second step before we put the final shadow on, but I think we'll be okay in this case with, with the colours being transparent. I'm able to go over and and just add a almost a glaze for my transition value. So my areas at the top of the figure here is darker. Spray that down a little bit. And there's a bit around the abdomen here.
see straight away my shadow value isn't dark enough, so I'm just going to go and darken that up a little bit. It's a new brush. It's a, it's a nice brush, but it, it, the point is a bit too too sharp for me. I don't quite like the point quite so sharp. So yeah, we're getting quite a lot of streaking happening here, purely because this is the paper that I'm using, and I'm being not watercolor paper. But hopefully, this is giving you a good idea. I'll, I'll move over to some watercolor paper for the for the final part while we paint the figure out a bit better. Okay, so hopefully that will give you something of an idea. spend too long on these want them to be nice and nice and quick just trying to create some sense of form and volume okay so hopefully that's starting to read now as light coming from this side or shadow being on this side you want to you can you can just increase that effect by putting a bit of a, a background value into these little studies torso studies mix up a dark with my brown and my blue like a dark violety brown and I can just come around here and put this in just to tidy up the, the contour a little bit on this side. Okay, so that's it folks for this part, part one. So you should end up with a sheet of these torsos, combined torsos, just shaded in with uh, shading in the the shadow pattern, or painting it in very basically like this. Um, so yeah, if you aim at kind of doing, if you're working A3, maybe this kind of scale. This is an A3 sheet of paper, so you can see that there. So I could fit maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about seven on one page. So if you aim to do maybe about two pages worth, uh, 14 little um, torso studies like this, 
try to, you know, I, I wouldn't say you have to strictly uh, keep to a time frame, but see if you can kind of keep it within the no longer than 20 minute mark. Certainly if you're, uh, if you're drawing, you want to keep it a bit quicker. See if you can aim at 10 minutes per drawing. Um, and if you're painting, obviously, maybe you might end up at the 15, 20 minute mark. Okay, so hopefully that's been a, an okay enough demonstration there. Just very some simple washes, just to create a sense of form once you've got your, your bean shape in, your combined torso mass, that bean shape, your head added to it, your basic shadow pattern mapped out. I wish you good luck with that. Look forward to seeing what you do for this part of the exercise. And I shall see you for part two.